Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. Discerninghearts.com presents St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, with Father Donald Haggerty. Father Haggerty is a priest of the Archdiocese of New York who serves at St. Patrick's Cathedral. He taught moral theology and worked as a spiritual director in seminaries for 20 years. He has directed numerous yearly retreats for the missionaries of charity. He is the author of Contemplative Provocations, The Contemplative Hunger, Conversion, Contemplative Enigmas, and St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, the book on which this series is based. St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, with Father Donald Haggerty. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Welcome, Father Haggerty. Thank you, Chris. It's good to be here. We are at the dawning light of the gift of contemplation. It is St. John of the Cross really wants to help the soul to experience what the Father has desired in this, this quest for the deepening of a relationship. Well, John of the Cross, in his collected works, in his treatises, uh, comes back to this question, this period in a spiritual life in which the beginning of contemplative graces may begin to show their signs and symptoms. And he considers that a, you know, in one way, a critically important time in spiritual life. It's a time of transition. And it's going to, uh, in a way, be a crossroad in the spiritual life. And he spends time with that in three of the major treatises, largely because I think he had, he noticed this um, time of difficulty, the problematic nature of it in his spiritual direction and his confessions with Carmelite sisters, with his own friars. And he saw it as truly a kind of crossroad because if a person does not meet the uh, or see through, have proper instruction on how to approach prayer in that time and move on to a next level in their prayer life, they can be, you know, not just held back, but perhaps, you know, permanently blocked, you know, and then remain at a, in a way, a, a certain frustrated level of prayer life, which then also then affects our time outside of prayer. So he was very concerned, it seems, not just to teach, you know, a kind of change in method of prayer. That's not what he's doing as much as addressing the important, uh, you could say, appropriation of the soul of graces of God in this time that are not easily discerned. So it's a, you know, just as a preliminary remark on that, it's a you know, when we speak of the dawning light of contemplation, which is a, a title of a, of a chapter there, that, you know, it's not an easy thing to see what's happening. So John of the Cross, as I mentioned, comes back a few times to this to make sure perhaps, you know, how clear the, uh, the teaching, you know, must be for, for souls who are, you know, serious about prayer. He recognized that in his time that souls may not have spiritual directors who can help guide them through this process properly, uh, let alone the fact that many would not even have access to a spiritual director or even someone who is learned enough to help them through this period. Yeah, that's correct. And I mean, times have not changed there. Um, what is unique? I mean, in, in one sense, we have more benefits than they may have had in that time. The writings of St. John of the Cross were not available. You know, the writings of St. Teresa of Avila were largely not available. She was writing for, uh, for, you know, in regard to inquiries about her spiritual life in that time. 
And nobody really had written with this kind of precise um, instruction that John of the Cross will write as a kind of almost like a psychological uh, in-depth treatment of the experiences of the person in prayer, the symptomatic aspects of this that take place in the experience of a soul undergoing initial contemplative graces. And the problem would be in that time that unless one had experience in this, they would not be um, open well to directing a soul to this proper adjustment in prayer that would need to be made. So John of the Cross, in one sense, is a, you know, he's a, is a key critical moment in the history of spirituality by finally identifying experiences that surely saints went through before this. People prayed for 15 centuries, you know, before this, they had their own adjustments and somehow, you know, made do with God and became saints. But to have something more precise in writing to, in a way, substitute also for what could be an absence of spiritual direction, that was invaluable for the church, you know, from that period on. Yeah, that's why I'm so grateful for what you've done with St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, because you've assimilated the various aspects of those works that would speak to this particular issue, among other things, but the the reality that there can be a, a confusion on many souls that, again, we're speaking of people who are, they're hopefully living this life of virtue, they want to have this deeper relationship. And so they may enter into prayer, and they begin to hit what seems to be maybe not so much a wall, or maybe it is like a wall, or it's something painful that seems to counter what they had either been taught or instructed, or maybe even read somewhere that they needed to pursue and they just don't know how to deal with it. In the context of this, uh, in John of the Cross's time and to the present time in serious spiritual, uh, I should say serious religious life and congregations, is the practice of um, some type of meditative prayer. And you know, from the time of St. Ignatius of Loyola, he, he predates St. John of the Cross, he is, I think his dates, or he's, he was born in the late 1400s, maybe 1490, I'll say, but he's born in that period. And then by the time St. John of the Cross is born, his spiritual exercises, his Jesuits are already now beginning to spread. And of course, influential in Spain, you know, particularly, and so the method of St. John of St. Ignatius of Loyola to teach in his spiritual exercises the great importance of a meditation. You know, the spiritual exercises themselves are a retreat of meditations on portions of the life of Jesus and central, you know, doctrinal truths. And the effort then almost every you know, good religious, and it could be true of a layperson. You know, good priests can teach this to lay people, the importance of doing a meditation on the gospel in particular as a kind of steady, not routine, but a steady practice of prayer in silence. And initially in one's spiritual life, this is, you could say, you know, it's one of those indispensable you know, practices because for one thing, it introduces and deepens our knowledge of Jesus Christ, reading the gospel privately every day, giving thought to what occurred in these scenes of the gospel, you know, slowly absorbing the words of Jesus, gaining lessons, you know, then, you know, seeing what is Jesus really teaching, what, what kind of virtue he is urging on our life, what kind of resolution I could make even in my own life on this day after reading this particular gospel, you know, all of that is very good practice. And the subject of John of the Cross, when he gets into the question of actual contemplative graces, has this as a background context, because the difficulty, 
for a person will be if they have grown in grace with God, meaning they're living virtuously. We don't have to be in a monastery or cloister to be living virtuously. They are living virtuously. They're giving themselves to the will of God. You know, they're taking attention off of self and giving to others. They are faithful in love for God. So if that's taking place and they are practicing some kind of, you know, daily effort of some routine of meditative prayer and silence, that prayer becomes in time with contemplative graces somewhat frustrated. As as though we were playing, you know, I'm not sure, playing golf, let's say, in sunny days every day. And all of a sudden, the clouds just, you know, descend on that golf course, which was nice and beautiful up to that time. And now everything's under shadow, under shade, and we can't see so well. You know, it's not a question of losing faith or doubt, but that meditative prayer becomes, for what seems to be no reason, now a difficulty. So I've kind of talked maybe too long there, but the, the context of this question of the dawning light of contemplation, of contemplative graces, does have that, that background uh, context, the assumption that a person is trying to give them to themselves to some silent reflective prayer, some imaginative prayer, perhaps, you know, about the gospel. Um, and then that runs into something of a wall of frustration at a certain point with the beginning of contemplative graces. Well, I think that's really important and, and possibly too, Father Haggerty, I, I know for me that for the listener out there right now, to possibly understand that the prayer that you have just spoken of is that time where you've made space, if we can say it that way, for that meditation of the gospels of that time when that opening to kind of enter into that type of discursive prayer that is different in some ways than those exercises, as it were, that we do to possibly intercede for others. Those type of moments where I'm thinking of praying the divine mercy for the world and offering that up, or praying the rosary and using that as a time of intercession for family or world events, or or even entering into the, the prayer of the church through either the sacramental liturgical actions. This is possibly a different moment in the person who is praying their experience of prayer. Is that a fair way of presenting that, Father? Yeah, that's very good, Chris. And I think it's it's good to um, for us to be aware there are different um, choices, preferences in prayer, and those preferences will not... Um, you know, be themselves and themselves an impediment to growing in grace with God. So we could say, you know, the context for John of the Cross in writing, you know, much of what he does with the incipient signs of of contemplation do have this background, the assumption that especially these Carmelite sisters, because that's who he was immediately engaging, they were living daily lives of some effort of meditation, you know, a meditation time. Missionaries of charity, Mother Teresa sisters will have that as a part of their morning prayer every day. So that would be customary to teach, you know, religious this, and then practice it. On the other hand, it can easily be that Uh, especially people in the world are praying a rosary. They're praying the divine chaplet, as you mentioned, you know, intercessory prayer. And that does not stop, of course, God from, if a person is giving themselves generously to God and really living virtuously, losing the self in some manner in a generous life, then contemplative graces could be expected to happen It's not that the meditation prayer is a necessity as a prerequisite for contemplative prayer or contemplative graces in the soul. 
you know, any more than meditation, prayer is required for holiness in a life. And the real reality of this is that when, if a person's will becomes more conformed with the will of God, if love is really, you know, penetrating, pervading the soul in a deeper manner, then that is going to have an effect on one's interior silent life of prayer. So if the person does, yes, they engage, let's say the rosary every day, they pray the divine chaplet, they're doing intercessory prayer. If they were to live a more silent time of prayer, they would likely yes, begin to have some of these symptoms also affecting them uh, that are described in the initial aspects of contemplative prayer. There's that point in this particular chapter where I thought it was so helpful when you said, unfortunately, souls almost resist the effect of the deeper grace. They do not surrender to the initiative of God's grace because they do not understand what is taking place. And I think that when you're in that type of meditative place, I mean, imagine you're maybe you're a guy who has begun praying before the Blessed Sacrament and you have always reflected, taken time to do exactly as you said, set your scene. Maybe you're even reading some helps like the Magnificat or or some other things during that time or adoration that always seem to bring a consolation or a deepening of prayer, but then it gets to a point where something's happening, something's changing, and they just don't understand why it doesn't feel the same as it did when I was doing it for the months prior. Is that a, a fair scenario? Yeah, that's definitely fair, um, accurate. Uh, and again, it would depend on the person and, you know, it's not going to, nothing, none of those things are going to happen too quickly in anyone's spiritual life. Uh, but the a kind of stiffening or, you know, a tightening up, you know, of the interior freedom that we might have had earlier, you know, to that thoughts came easily, reflective thoughts, you know, in front of the Blessed Sacrament, a sense of being really able to converse with our Lord or sense that he is, um, you know, really listening, that easy prayer becomes harder, you know, as if we are going past this time of uh, into contemplative graces. And, and just to, to, to backtrack uh, on, on one thing too, because you suggested in the beginning of your comment just now, you know, if you, if you do assume that the context is of people trained in meditative prayer, and I meet this all the time with the missionaries of charity, so they're, they're trained in a novitiate to do a meditation and with the gospel, you know, to try to even be a kind of spectator at that scene of the gospel, to really gaze on our Lord, those who are there, to try to, you know, take some, some teaching there, something that is very personal from our Lord. And if that's the context of prayer and they're trained in that, and that begins to become frustrated or some kind of tightening takes place and the imagination doesn't seem to be functioning so well now, a dryness and emptiness in this. The problem with this is that these people are precisely the good people. They are meaning they've been very virtuous. They have followed, you know, the things of instruction in the life with the poor, they're living the vows of obedience, chastity, poverty, their life with the poor is generous. They are, these are the virtuous self-giving people and self-giving people tend to continue to follow what they have been taught and trained in. So they, they have been formed in a certain manner and the formation you know, instructs them to do this type of meditation, and then it begins to um, become difficult. And so that type of person does what? They try harder. They push themselves harder. They force, you know, themselves to try to get some fruits and some benefit from the meditation that is becoming more and more difficult as a practice. And John of the Cross's point on that is that 
you end up frustrating yourself. It's like you've, without realizing it, gotten off the road a little bit, and now you're running in the sand in, in, instead of on something, uh, you know, very easy as asphalt, let's say. And now you're running on, you know, in a manner that, you know, without understanding, have very difficult uh, time moving forward. So it's a question of entering into frustrations that we may have brought on ourselves in some way by not realizing where grace is actually leading in that time. Yeah, I think that's part of the danger, even in our times, where we, again, people may not have access to a, a competent spiritual director. When I say competent, someone who's living a rich, deep life of prayer and has had some training at the least and can kind of help souls through this point. But in our day, people have so much access to a number of different wonderful spiritual works. They can even hear podcasts. They can even watch videos, all these different types of things. And they only get pieces of those instructions and not placed into the broader, bigger context. What I mean by that is that you may have somebody who is experiencing what seems like this, what we'll call dryness in this prayer at this time. They're living a virtuous life. They still feel very close to God, and yet because they've heard something, potentially just a snippet of the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, and there's a one point where it says if you begin to feel a desolation, for example, that don't make a change, stick with it, persevere through it. And that's where it begins to become nuanced, because that desolation that Ignatius is speaking of is more of a desolation that of all the things of God, you don't even want to, you don't want to go to mass. You don't want to do things. You want to let go of everything, <laughs> which is different than what St. John is speaking about here. But the person who only has portions can become very confused. I didn't try to make this too big, but I've heard this from many people over the course of years, and it can be confusing. Yes. And you know, even with the St. Ignatius uh, question of a consolation, desolation, but we have to remember there too that uh, I'm not, you know, an expert or, you know, perhaps even a good guide in commenting on St. Ignatius of Loyola on this, but, but he was addressing these comments too for the inside of this retreat, you know, the 30-day retreat or the eight-day, you know, shortened version of the 30-day retreat. Mm -hmm. So it's possible within meditations, within that context, that, you know, the person needs, you know, when they're giving thought in, you know, effort of reflection, imaginative effort toward these particular scenes to persevere through it. And, you know, that that has some message also to uh, the, the soul in that moment. But, you know, John of the Cross is really, you know, it's a serious question. You know, when you read St. John of the Cross, and you, if you study him well, it, it becomes a question, is he proposing here, is he exposing to us what really are, in a sense, the rules and principles of what does happen, not, you know, just to some, but he's speaking, it would seem, about what's going to happen inevitably as part of the path to sanctity with God. So granted, there are going to be, you know, endless, countless variations on God's relations with souls. But if it's true that when a person grows, you know, if they grow with God in relationship with God, if they give themselves more fully to the will of God, then John of the Cross seems to be proposing that that's going to have inevitable effects on the interior life in relations with God. So it's not as though, you know, a person will, can avoid these things. The problem is more that if you don't, you know, begin to see what that, what those rules, principles, what happens as we grow deeper with God, if we don't realize that, we may be opting for ways of prayer that leave us, you know, 
perhaps satisfied in some manner, but at a more superficial level with God. So it, it's a big question. If, if the church also, you know, called him at a certain point in the 1920s, you know, the mystical doctor of the church, that would sound to me like something that the Holy Spirit wanted also at that point in, in history, that he would be understood maybe more now, 100 years later, as someone who is an essential guide for the deeper, you know, realm of relationship with God. And, you know, and that John of the Cross himself would spread out much more as a, an instructive, you know, force in the church. Perhaps, you know, St. John Paul II is part of that, uh, that, that choice of the Holy Spirit to allow St. John of the Cross to be a, a more prominent person of, of uh, guidance in the church. You've been listening to St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, with Father Donald Haggerty. This series is based on the book, St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation, published by Ignatius Press. Visit Ignatius.com to obtain a copy, or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit DiscerningHearts.com or you can find it within the free Discerning Hearts app. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for St. John of the Cross, Master of Contemplation with Father Donald Haggerty.